Hey everybody, welcome to the Nintendo Wirecast. I'm one of your hosts, TJ, and unfortunately, Amiibo Jason struck ill this morning. We did have some plans to be able to record. We pushed it off a couple days because of the holiday, but never you fear, we have an amazing replacement today. No stranger to the Nintendo Wire channel, in fact. This gentleman was the guest of episode 55 of Smash Supremacy. His name is Brandon Pugmire. How are you doing today, Brandon? I am doing great. Hello, everybody. I'm honored to be filling in for Amiibo Jason. Brandon has actually been mentioned on the podcast before. I don't know if it was by name, but when we were talking about the first time I ever held a pro controller, that was with you. We went to the Nintendo preview event in LA together. That's right, yeah. And as soon as that thing was set in my hands, I was like, oh, this feels so good. And then it was nothing but disappointment for me since then. It was the opposite for me. It was actually opposite for me. When I first held it, I was like, yeah, it's okay. And now I only play with the Pro Controller. Yeah, Jason too. He loves that Pro Controller. For I, I was kind of burned. I was burned at the beginning where I kept trying to spawn Wolf Link into Breath of the Wild. And I kept trying to <laughs> uh, exploit the Amiibo and Mario Odyssey. And as I'm like running, trying to get this NFC reader to spawn whatever I want into the game, it just would not do it. <laughs> and then also the, the D-pad registers suggestions. It doesn't really respect my authority when it comes to <laughs> my button commands. But nobody here wants to hear me belittle the Pro Controller any more than I already have done. So a little history on Brandon and I. We were sword fighting teammates for, what, like 10 plus years? Yeah, pretty pretty close to that, yeah. In Los Angeles as part of a, a team of sword fighters for film, TV, commercials, and tons of live shows. We must have done hundreds of live shows together. At least, yeah. It was a blast. So Brandon and I initially bonded over our sword fighting, and then that extended into our mutual love and affection for Nintendo games. And that's why you were the first person I thought of when I knew I had to uh, find a substitute for Amiibo Jason. So no downgrade, people. <laughs> we also have a special episode planned. This is the last episode of the year. Jason and I thought that it would be a fun idea to go through each year of the Switch and do a little bit of a year in review for 2017, 2018, and then most recently 2019 with a game that stood out as our personal pick for game of the year, any notable runner up and any disappointments that happened in that year, just to kind of check back in, see where we're at and give kind of a third year progress report. Fortunately, Brandon is ready to jump right on in. If you came for the ring fit update, I know that that's been a regular staple of the show. Don't worry, Jason and I are both in post game and we have our post game thoughts, but we'll delay that until next week because I want to be able to share that conversation with Jason. Uh, although Brandon did say that that our, our hard work in the ring fit inspired you to uh, be curious about the game. You're ring curious now? I am very ring curious now. <laughs> I saw those results. They speak for themselves, don't they? Plus, I gotta, I gotta beat that... Yeah, that that buff villain really needs to be taken down. What was it, what's his name again? Drago. Drago, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. He's one of my favorite villains, I think, of any Nintendo game. Almost instantly. Just something about his, his bro personality bursting through. It just makes you want to punch him in the face. You just want to punch him so bad. <laughs> and he's huge and menacing and imposing. Everything that is great about a villain where you're immediately the underdog and you can see you've got a lot of ground to cover to be able to have what it takes to be able to handle them. So it's it's fun. And the game lets you fight him a lot. So you have a lot of opportunities to test yourself against his royal dragon-ness. Great, so I'll have a lot of opportunities to, to punch him in the face. Yeah, not only punch him, you also get to kick him. You get to, I don't know, ab bomb him. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how you'd call that. Like a, you're, you're whacking him with your six pack basically. And then also some kind of I don't know if it's a lotus flower attack. People who are familiar with the Ring Fit game know what I'm talking about. Anytime you use the balance moves, you use like a lotus or a flower of some kind. It's not a delicate flower. It's the kind, maybe it's an aloe vera plant. I don't even know. But whatever it is, it's devastating. Yeah, it's got thorns. It's actually kind of good that you're on this episode because my first experience with the Switch in hand was with you at that preview event. Now, now the way that Nintendo scheduled the events, they, they crossed the country. They started in New York and then they finished in LA, which is where... Brandon and I both lived at the time, but by the time they got to LA, it was the actual release date of the Switch. So you had bought the Switch 
ahead of time? You pre-ordered it? I had pre-ordered it, yeah. But had you had a chance to play it before we went to the event? I had not. So the event was the first time I actually handled it. So I was a little nervous, I guess, about going into it and thinking, oh my, is this going to be terrible? And I, did I just pre-order some terrible new piece of junk? <laughs> I did not pre-order it, which was actually a, a rarity for me. Normally, it doesn't really matter what Nintendo is releasing from a console side of things. I, I'm, I'm down. But what really kind of threw me was that I knew the next two weeks to two months of my life were going to be completely dedicated to Breath of the Wild. And I was committed to playing it on the Wii U. And the reason for that is because I remember back when Twilight Princess first released for the GameCube and the Wii, that even though we had the motion control, it was actually developed for the GameCube. And so it was optimized for that system. And that's definitely through the prism of history as we look back. Even though the Wii version had the novelty and the gimmick, the definitive version was definitely the one for GameCube. And I kind of had a suspicion that that would be the case for Breath of the Wild as well. It was programmed and designed for the Wii U. So what we were essentially receiving for the Switch was a day one port. But because they knew they were doing it ahead of time, it was, it was like questionable how much they were going to actually be able to take advantage of any of the Switch's boosted processing power over the Wii U. So I did hold off. The first game that we played, if I remember... Was, was that Snipper Clips? I think it was. That was fun. That that immediately grabbed my attention. And even though the Joy-Con felt really weird in my hand, and I did not love it, I liked the application in that game. And it was fun that you and I had to cooperatively try to achieve these really bizarre objectives. Yeah. And actually, Snipper Clips ended up being the first game I bought for the Switch. And then kind of alongside Breath of the Wild. Because I played it with you at that event, and I loved it. And I thought, this is, gonna, this is a great way to introduce people to this console. So that event actually motivated you to buy that game? It did, yeah. Nice. My takeaway by the time we left that was pretty sour on the Switch, on the whole. It wasn't like I was like, oh, this is the worst console ever. I'm never going to buy this. But I did feel like I don't need to rush out and pick this thing up. And we spent uh, a few evenings playing Breath of the Wild next to each other, but independently. Yeah. Where I was playing it on the Wii U and you were playing it on the Switch. And we were both kind of scanning as many Amiibo as we could to get as much awesome <laughs> stuff, which was a super yeah. cool feature that, that was shared between both versions of the game. So even though I didn't actually own it, I was able to kind of witness it firsthand through watching you play it and have some direct comparisons while I was playing on the Wii U to some of the similar things that you were encountering on the Switch. Yeah, I think that was cool. Cool comparison. You got to see firsthand the poor uh, battery life of the Switch. Yeah, and I, I don't know if there's a game that's been released yet that is more demanding on the battery than Breath of the Wild. You you would essentially like play until it died. Yeah. Because we were using a charger that wasn't the original charger to try to charge it, the battery depleted faster than it could be <laughs> yeah. charged back up. So naturally, my first impression was kind of colored by that. And I'm like, well, that's lame. Even if it's plugged in, you can't play it. <laughs> yeah. But of course, if it had been the wall charger that comes with it, that wouldn't have been the case. Right. But they, they lured us in with this universal input, making you think, oh, this will work no matter where you plug it in. Such is not the case, as we discovered. <laughs> but this is probably a good segue into that first year of bests. I'll kick this off. I did everything that I could to try to avoid for this list here choosing ports because we were both Wii U owners. And we both had a ton of fun with Wii U titles. So most of the titles that came out for Switch that are ports, I, I already knew were fantastic games. I was three to five years ahead of most of the world, so were you, when it came to realizing how great some of those games were. So I tried to pick things that were exclusive Switch experiences. However, for 2017, even though I put in a thousand plus hours of Breath of the Wild on Wii U, I do still have to make that my 2017 game of the year because I did go back through and play all of it again when I did purchase a Switch and 100% it again because the game is just that great. I do have a notable mention. My first runner up is Snipper Clips because I feel like Snipper Clips is the game that the only launch game really that offered a unique experience, something that you really couldn't get somewhere else. Splatoon was pretty recent. It wasn't a launch title on, on the Switch, right? It came out a couple months later, if I'm recalling correctly. Splatoon 2, yeah. But we did play it at that event, so I, I kind of conflate that a little bit in my mind. But my, my impression was this is just more of Splatoon 1 with a single screen interface, so it immediately seemed like a downgrade to me. <laughs> and then we played Mario Kart, which was great, but 
it's Mario Kart. We've been playing it for five years already before that game even came out on, on Wii U. Right. So Snipper Clips, I was like, this game is really fun. I've never played anything like this. It's super fast paced and there's about a thousand different ways that you and your friend could cooperate or at least attempt to cooperate to try to achieve these various objectives. And after we played it at that event, I did play it through the, it, it, in its entirety with my brother and we just had a blast. And I've since bought, I think it's Snipper Clips Plus and watching my wife and my daughter play through that together has been a, a great source of hilarity in the house. <laughs> For my one disappointment of the year, this one really let me down because I had super high expectations. Anybody who knows me who's been following Smash Supremacy, I often joke about how life is too short to play Fire Emblem games. It's because Fire Emblem is a dauntingly large, intimidatingly difficult JRPG, and I just don't have time for that in my life. But 2017 promised a game called Fire Emblem Warriors. And I loved Hyrule Warriors. I thought that Hyrule, Hyrule Warriors is still on my, probably my top five games of all time. The, my favorite thing about every Zelda game is the combat. And I thought that taking Fire Emblem characters and distilling it into this non-turn-based game where I could have more of an action play style, it would allow me to interact with these characters in some way outside of Smash and having another measure to be able to explore who they are, their le their legends, their lore, their world, their storylines appealed a lot to me. But unfortunately, the game did not even run as well as, you know, I'm going to I'm going to say this. It didn't even run as well as Hyrule Warriors Legends on the new 3DS. It had a lot of sluggish gameplay. I'm not usually a frame rate counting kind of guy, but it definitely was enough to keep me from wanting to play the game. So after a few stages, I'm like, you know what? Honestly, I'd rather just be playing Hyrule Warriors again on the Wii U. <laughs> what do you got for 2017, Brandon? It's very similar to yours. You talked about not choosing a port, where, where I guess Breath of the Wild could technically be a port-ish. It's a day one port, so it gets a pass. It gets a port pass. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I absolutely have to say that's 2017's best game. I played that more than any other game that year. Or, I mean, it's right up there with the most played game for me ever. Right behind Skyrim, <laughs> I think. Oh, and you're, and that's coming from a guy who, if I recall, you did everything in Skyrim. I did absolutely everything in Skyrim. On the Xbox, got every achievement for all the DLC, did every side quest, made every weapon. I did. I don't know how many hours I put into that. <laughs> A lot. Not to sidetrack your, your thought process too much, but did you double dip and go Skyrim for Switch? I did. Nice. Yep. I started a new profile, got some missions down, and then realized there's too many other games I need to touch as well. In a post-Breath of the Wild world, is Skyrim playable? It is playable, but it's very disappointing when you see a mountain and then realize I cannot traverse that without trying to glitch myself up the side of it. Ah, uh, yes. See, you lost me at glitch. <laughs> I haven't played it. I've never actually even played it one time, but I've, I've heard a lot of people say that when you start to get a game that large, one of the natural byproducts is that there are unexpected bugs or glitches that are, are difficult to anticipate. Sure. And so it, it is a part of the experience where you just have to accept that that's going to be a part of Skyrim. It's kind of like a, a Rockstar's games like GTA or Red Dead where the glitches are almost part of its charm because you know that there's going to be crazy glitches. <laughs> or The Witcher 3 when your horse is flying and oh. <laughs> stuck in trees and stuff mm. like that. It's, mm. it's kind of part of its charm. But uh, Breath of the Wild was just beautiful in every way. Yeah. And I am so excited for the sequel. Me too. It was like rife with magic moments. No matter what, I felt like every single time I sat down to play, and I played it aggressively. I was like, I am going to beat this game in as short of a time as possible so that I can start being a responsible parent again, so I can start being a present husband again, so I can return to business as usual. But I would sit down with an agenda and then before I realized it, I just spent three three hours taming horses. Yeah, exactly. Do you have any like standout moments? Some of my favorite moments were just the, in the ridiculous ways in which enemies <laughs> are defeated. Yeah. But like you come up with a plan. Oh, I'm gonna take out these enemies with I don't know whatever a bomb and some explosive barrel or something like that. And then it just goes totally different. <laughs> Doesn't go to plan, but I love all the different ways you can tackle each situation, too. Yeah. That's what made it so fun. I think that's what brings people back to it, mm -hmm. is that the combat was so fluid and intricate, but approachable. Yeah, and because it was physics-based, you could have so many different unexpected results that 
that followed logic. Like once something happened, you're like, oh yeah, okay. I just blew myself up or I, I blew that thing up or that thing went flying. But you don't always know until you test it out. Right. It had some serious trial and error. It rewarded trial and error. And many of the times you end up dying or severely injured, yes. which made it even more fun. Yeah, I blew myself off a million things on accident just trying to... Oh, yeah. I've crushed myself self with many boxes and rocks. <laughs> it's great. And even as experienced as I am with the game now, I'm not at the level of these people who are using exploits to be able to bomb themselves all the way across the map, get off the plateau early. <laughs> I believe the record was just broken. Somebody does 100% completion. That includes collecting all 900 Koroks in something like 23 hours. Insane. It's unreal. That's the one thing I didn't do in the game. I did not collect all the Korok seeds. The golden turd just wasn't enticing enough. You know, something about that. I think is one of the greatest rewards ever in the history of video games because you collect these little golden nuggets the entire game called seeds and you're just like this is clearly valuable it's golden we've been trained to know that gold is valuable <laughs> and Throughout this entire thing, they have a, a modicum of usefulness. You can use them to expand your inventory. That's about it. Once you've collected some 400, you've, you've maxed out your inventory. So everything after that is just for bragging rights, unless you get all 900. And then when you realize that the reward for this is this big golden turd. <laughs> it's literal. <laughs> then you realize that every single Korok seed that you've gotten up to that point is a little rabbit turd from these Koroks. I, I know for myself, I was like, how did I not realize this all along? Because it even says it has a distinctive smell. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the description of it. And I'm like, oh, they're like, oh, okay, you want to go through this whole world? You want to scour this massive Zelda game, the largest game in Legend of Zelda history, more collectibles than any other Zelda game of all time? You're going to do all of this? What do you get? A steaming golden turd <laughs> it's just it's too good i wondered if it was some kind of commentary you know like you do all this work in this digital world and it gets you nothing i think that it absolutely is that and i would have loved to have been a fly on the wall during the conversations that they were having to, to hear how that came about with like okay i got this idea what if they accomplished the most difficult task, the most time-intensive task that Zelda has ever offered, <laughs> and the reward is a piece of poo <laughs> <laughs> that you can't even do anything with? It's just like a trophy. It just sits in your bag. My one criticism is I wish that I could at least put it on display in my home. <laughs> I wish that I could at least put it on yes. my nightstand or something so that... I can be constantly reminded. Wait, I hope in the sequel there are more display options. I was thinking about that recently where what could they possibly present that's on the same level as collecting Koroks? That's just a huge time sink. Yeah. I, I have no idea. I, I imagine there's going to be something because they're intentionally making it a Breath of the Wild sequel because it allows them to use this very well-received game engine. But the expectation then is that it's also going to to share perhaps in the scale of Breath of the Wild, which was a massive game. So I, re I really do wonder how they're gonna equalize that. I don't know, but I am so excited. Well, we, we shared our, our top pick for 2017. Do you have a, a runner up or a notable mention? Uh, yes, I played Splatoon on the Wii U and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a unique take on the, the kind of shooter genre. Yeah. And then Splatoon 2, I absolutely loved because they added a lot more custom character customization and I thought it was fantastic. Did you feel like there was it was anyway downgraded from the Wii version because of the single screen interface? No, I actually didn't. It took a little getting used to, but it was I think it was better cuz my attention was more focused on one screen and it's a pretty fast-paced game. Okay. Are you a motion control man? I wasn't originally for Splatoon. But as it ended its run with the, all the, uh, the updates and stuff, I started switching over to motion controls and started to realize that I played better with motion controls than I did without. Uh, but generally, I do not play with motion controls. I think that's probably exactly what they were hoping, was that once people tried the motion control, they'd realize it was the superior way to play. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do have to say, I wish that Splatoon was a game that I got more into. I did buy Splatoon for Wii, and... I tried to play it. I feel like maybe I just couldn't power through the controls enough. And I love the concept of the game. I super love the style of the game. 
Yeah, it's really unique. It's fresh. It's totally fresh. Yeah, it's fresh. <laughs> uh, but for me, it kind of suffers from Star Fox syndrome, where the only capacity in which I can enjoy them is in Smash Brothers. Hmm. Like I cannot play a Star Fox game to save my life. Not I'm not. This is not a negative criticism of Star Fox games. For some reason, they just I can't play them. I don't like them, and I feel like that's where Splatoon is. But it makes me sad because I want to like it. I just, and and every now and then I go through and I I just try to play a little bit to help my daughter. But we recently have undergone a, a little bit of a changing of the guards where she doesn't even bother to ask me to help her anymore because she knows that her skills have far surpassed mine. <laughs> so we kind of ha we have to do it the other way around. If I need something done and I'm getting a little frustrated, I'm like, can you just get this guy for me, please? <laughs> But I don't enjoy it at the end of the day. Glad you do, though. I mean, clearly, it's a game that's really successful. I mean, it wasn't close to being top because of Breath of the Wild, but it's definitely one of my favorite Switch games. So now, if Breath of the Wild were out of the equation... I think Splatoon 2 would probably take it, yeah. Was there anything in that first year, that first launch window, that didn't live up to your expectations or that you found to be a bit of a disappointment? Uh, you know, it's tough because... I generally don't purchase a game unless I do a bit of research on it first and know that it has something that I'm going to like. So at least in 2017, there wasn't really too many disappointments that I can think of. Going back to that preview event that we went to, we got to play Mario Kart Deluxe. Yes. They let us play it in two different styles. One of them, you were f kind of forced to play it in a makeshift airplane. Airplane, yeah, which was really funny. Yeah, they set up the scenario where you were playing it in, in portable mode or tabletop mode, rather. Yeah. And I remember us having a conversation about which Joy-Con felt less awkward in our in our hands. Right. Do you want to have your buttons be in the center of the controller, or do you want your joystick to be in the center of the controller? And and I first anticipated that I would be the most bothered by my, my buttons being in the center, but I actually found it was the other way around, where when I was using one controller, I kind of want my joystick to be on the far left. And I would rather my right thumb have to reach for the buttons. I hate the joystick being in the center of the controller. Yeah. Actually, now that you mentioned that, I'd say my biggest disappointment, I think, for 2017 was the Joy-Cons. Especially earlier on, early on when I only had a few games, when I would introduce someone to it, I'd use Snipper Clips as an example of like, hey, check this tabletop mode out. It's really cool. And whoever I'd played with would only want to play for a few minutes because they're like, ah, oh, this is really uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, it actually is. <laughs> this is the first time in the history of Nintendo where I have preferred third-party controllers to Nintendos. I, and I would even say where a strong argument could be made that the higher quality controllers are actually third party. When you start to factor in Joy-Con drift, which some people argue is a myth. I don't know if you've experienced this yourself, but I have eight Joy-Cons and three of them are confirmed Joy-Con drift. People will always say, oh, well, you abuse it, you misuse it. No, <laughs> no. I, we have delegated particular color controllers to each family member. So I know exactly what kind of usage each Joy-Con is getting. And there is some serious controller respect going on in my house. I absolutely mandate it as a condition of use, a term of service. My kids don't touch controllers if their hands are not washed, if, uh, <laughs> if they get angry with the game, and I even suspect I catch a whiff of them wanting to take it out on the controller. I'm like, gaming is done, kids, forget about it. <laughs> It's just it's just a design flaw. Yeah. And it's it's regrettable. People are like, well, it's no big deal. Nintendo admitted that there's a problem and they fix them for free. Yeah, they fix them for free if you live in America. I live in Taiwan. <laughs> Nintendo of Taiwan does not do free Joy-Con repairs. I also know that this is not true of Nintendo of Europe. They complain a lot about the repairs not being free. So that's really just a, an America-only solution. And I think it might be because America is the loudest critics. Yeah, yeah, we we would be. Have you personally encountered any Joy-Con drift? Thankfully, I have not. But I agree with you with the uh, third-party suppliers and whatnot for controllers. Uh, aside from my pro controller now, I only used third-party controllers. Is there a particular one that you prefer? Uh, yes, there's a GameCube one. Are you talking about that Power A one? I used that for a while, and then I, it started getting funky on me. Oh no! I love that. The left, yeah, the left, uh, the left joystick. Yeah, it started whacking out on me, and I couldn't fix it. Mm. So I switched to a wired 
GameCube controller from another company. They're the ones that make them with all the uh, character little logos on them. Oh, is that Hori? It might be Hori. Yeah, but it's a pretty affordable wired GameCube controller, and I actually love that one. What design did you go for? Is it that sweet Zelda one? Uh, I have the Mario one. It's the red and black one. They're all good. They are. I have to admit, I was tempted by them from a collector standpoint, where I was looking at them, and I was like, yep. I want all of those. And I think if I was like a bachelor or a single gamer, I probably would have bought those. But I think one of the best things to have emerged out of modern gaming is the disappearance of cords. Because as a dad, just playing the NES Mini and the SNES Mini, that thing has been kicked off the shelf so many times from a kid <laughs> cord crossing and just not being aware. Yep that I started just keeping the console on the floor so that it would kind of skid across the floor a little bit instead of coming off a shelf. So I try to avoid the cords as much as possible. So do I. I generally play in handheld mode anyway with my Switch, so I usually just use my Pro Controller since you can still connect with it. Mm. Have you been even remotely tempted by the Switch Lite? No, because there's times where I want to dock it. Yeah. I, my favorite way to game is local co-op. Couch co-op or like uh, Smash Brothers, you know, you're fighting your friend and there's there's just something about playing with someone who's sitting next to you. Yeah, same. And I like being able to dock it, sit on a couch and play that way. I'm with you like that. Should we move on to 2018? Let's do it. All right, I'll get us started again. This should not come as a surprise to anyone. I was very late to the party with the Switch, as I mentioned. I actually purchased the Switch in 2018, and this was in the wake of the announcement of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. There were only two reasons, well, two main reasons that I didn't purchase the Switch at launch, and they were Breath of the Wild and Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS. There was no reason for me to upgrade to Switch because the only two games that I played currently were available on the Wii U. But once I knew Ultimate was coming out, there was no question I was gonna buy this. At the time, Smash Brothers for Wii U was where all of my content was coming from. I was still making Smash Supremacy, I was still doing Me V Me and Custom Conquest, and all of this interacted with Smash Brothers for Wii U. So I was super excited at the prospect of a new game, and at the time I was we, we were all really speculating, is this a port? Is this a new installment of the game? And what we got wound up being so much more than I ever expected. It was built on the, the same engine as the one for Wii U, but why not? It was a fantastic engine and I loved it and I still love it now. And every change that they made, I think was an improvement for the most part. I'll qualify that for the most part, actually. The one criticism that I have is the streamlining of the Miis. Even though, generally speaking, I think that the Mii fighters play better, they no longer have varying weight and size. So now when my daughter and I are in the game and my sons were all the same height, whereas before they scaled. So you can make somebody tall and skinny, you can make somebody short and round, and now everybody's just the same standardized body type. And that, that's really the my only criticism of the game. Everything else, I love it. Superior cast, unbelievable roster, so many surprises, and the game is not even over yet. It keeps getting better with regular DLC releases. While I love Smash, and I play it as often as I can, it's the center of my content, it's not even the most that the game gives me. I listen to Smash Brothers music exclusively, almost maybe four hours a day, <laughs> because I do a lot of writing and editing, and I can't have music that has words, because if I'm hearing words while I'm writing words, I start writing the words that I'm hearing. But video game music has always been a strong source of inspiration for me, and you couldn't ask for a more eclectic collection of video games' greatest hits than Smash Brothers. There's over 30 hours of music. It is phenomenal. I can't say enough good things about that game, but there is another game that also released in 2018 that's not a 2018 game, but it was released for Switch for 2018 that I put in a shocking number of hours and probably about 100 hours, and I 100%ed it. Actually, the game counts percentage is a little bit weird, so I 112%ed it, and that would be Hollow Knight. See, I was hoping you were gonna say that one. It's a game that I never thought I would like because I struggle with, with Metroid. Yeah. And I struggle with Metroid-style games. I struggle with the Castlevania games that have more of a Metroid flair because I get lost, and I don't appreciate that. I don't like not knowing where I'm going, and I don't like wasting long periods of time trying to figure out what to do next. But the thing about Hollow Knight was it had such a stripped down story and such an unbelievably haunting atmosphere that I found anywhere that I wound up interesting. 
And even though I would oftentimes traverse the same section of the game over and over again, because of the way that they release abilities and give you new incentives to explore, I was never bored. And the game is, I don't know if this is just me, but it felt bitingly difficult. And so when I accomplished certain sections, whether it was platforming or fighting, I found myself feeling very accomplished when I completed it. And that really left a strong impression on me. I can't, cannot wait for the sequel centering around Hornet. Uh, we don't have a release date for that yet, but I can't imagine it's terribly far off because it began its life as Hollow Knight DLC and then just ballooned into its own thing. So I'm super pumped with that. Then the final thing I'll say for 2018 is a disappointment. Now, please don't mistake this in any way as me saying this is a bad game. This game just didn't live up to my personal expectations, and I'll tell you why. Uh, my biggest letdown in 2018 was Kirby Star Allies. I feel like possibly the best Kirby game that was ever made was Kirby Robobot. Totally agree. My kids played a ton of it, and so I was kind of hoping for a Switch multiplayer version of Kirby Robobot, or a game that at least was that fun. I actually find Star Allies to be really unfun. You have really easy multiplayer. You can jump in, jump out whenever you want, but I just find myself stumbling through the levels without really any meaningful sense of accomplishment or without any real direction. We get to these places where you have to team up, but it's not always super clear to me what I need to, who I need to team up with. And you don't always have what you need when you need it to progress. The computer kind of helps you out almost to the point where th they start taking the reins when I don't want them to, and they don't step up when I need them to. So the game just wound up really falling a little flat for me. All right, Brandon, how, how did you see 2018? Well, very similar, actually. Super Smash Brothers was my most looked forward to game for the Switch. And when it came out, it did not disappoint in any way. I still play it often. Same. And it never gets boring to me. It's so good that I, I find it hard to believe that there's going to be another version of Smash Brothers that can even compare. Let's be honest. There's no way it can, right? This is the pinnacle. There, there isn't. And I don't, I don't think there can be another Smash Brothers after this. Yeah, but well, they have to completely reinvent. Sakurai just keeps putting more stuff in, even though he keeps saying, oh, okay, we're done after this. Oh, actually, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Well, he took that charge from late President Satoru Iwata very seriously, where he's like, make make this game great. And, and he took it to heart, and he is d delivering and delivering. He's making it more than great. Yeah, it's just, it's incredible. And other companies, you know, uh, third-party companies are like, begging to be in Smash Brothers at this point. Who would have thought that we'd, we'd see a time when characters that are famous for being on Sony, uh, even though Cloud is not a Sony character and he's not even exclusive to that system anymore, but I think he's super closely associated with the PlayStation. Right. And Banjo-Kazooie is a known Xbox property, even though he's more closely associated with Nintendo, all fighting together in the same game. Sega, the rival from the 90s, is now there. Yeah. They're, they're all there. They really are all there. Except for Waluigi. Yes. Yeah, so while we're on the <laughs> subject of this, Jason and I have talked about this a lot, but out of the DLC characters that we've received so far, which one's your favorite? Piranha Plant, hands down. He's actually one of my mains. She, actually. She is one of my mains. I am so not surprised by that because that character <laughs> is totally your style. For those of you at home who don't know, Brandon is a shy guy main in everything that's possible to be a shy guy in. <laughs> yes. Is it the black shy guy usually you like to play as? Yeah, in Mario Kart? Yeah. yeah. So Piranha Plant is totally your speed. If you had to venture, I don't know, a guess or a prediction as to who you think that last DLC slot for the Fighters Pass is, where would you think it's going? Sadly, we both know it's not Waluigi, and I think that we can both it, yeah, agree yeah. Waluigi would be a very worthy entry. He but, would. He really would. Um, gosh, at this point, it's so hard to guess. Yeah. I know it was supposedly leaked a long time ago. It was going to be the uh, the chorus. Uh, what are they called? The, the chorus, chorus kids? kids or? There, there's not a character uh, left in video game who at one point has not been rumored to be that fifth right. DLC spot. I think, I think a character like that is likely, though, something really unique and off the wall. Yeah. Whatever it is, I, I'm convinced, and obviously Sakurai could lay this to bed but i'm convinced it's going to be third party so i wouldn't i wouldn't expect a rhythm heaven rep yes actually there's so few icons left there's crash there's lara croft there's i guess master chief yeah it doesn't seem like anyone is off the table like 
it could be anybody. Right. Even Sora, Jason, I talked about last time, is not off the table. Sora would be great. Sora would be a great addition, I think. Though a non-sword user might be better because there's a lot of sword users now at this point. Dude, come on. You're a sword fighter. We cannot, <laughs> I know, we cannot I know. have enough. That is your trade. You make money as a sword fighter. You know what it is? Hero is so annoying to fight. <laughs> And I'm just like, put your sword away. I get that. I get that. I like that heroes in the game a lot, but... Oh, I love it. And I love that there's different variations. That hero. That is so cool. That's the other thing that's just so cool that Sakurai does. He's like, here's this character. But not only is it just this character, here's this variation of this character. Yeah, he finds a way to, to deliver on the impossible and then does it in a way that's so much better than you ever could have expected or hoped for. Yeah. So I'm sure whatever it is, we will not be disappointed. Uh, if you had to pick, like if you had a choice, if they were like, Brandon, it is your choice who this last DLC character is going to be. Pick one character throughout all of gaming. The one rule is that he has to have originated in a game. Who would you pick? I would probably pick either Spyro or Crash Bandicoot. Not because I like them. I've never played a Crash Bandicoot game. I've played like one Spyro game. But Spyro would be a unique character. He could have... A Cool, unique moveset. What, but would he, though? He's like either Chibi Ridley or Purple Charizard. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> but, they're, but they're, you know, stars of pretty big game series, especially back in the day. That's true. So I think they'd win a lot of nostalgia points. And also, they're kind of coming back. There was a recent Spyro game. Yeah. Crash had a... There's a didn't they release a... Yeah, the Insane Trilogy. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I can speak for Jason when I say that, that both of us are in agreement that Crash would be big. Because if you could have Crash, yeah. Mario, and Sonic all face off, that is history unlike the gaming world has ever seen. That would be an unprecedented battle of rivals. And I think it could happen. I so. think it could, too. I'm, I am hopeful. I think uh, I'm just like you. I've never played a Crash game. I've played one Spyro game. But I think Crash would be a very worthy send-off for this Fighter's Pass. Yeah, I'd probably only play Crash once and then just go back to Piranha Plant and DDD. <laughs> you know, that's actually my DLC character strategy is I play through classic mode one time to get the spirit because I am a obsessive spirit tracker. I, I need to have every spirit in the game. Okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'll beat the game and then get the spirit and then I'll probably never touch that character again except for when I punch him in the face with the supreme ultimate fighter in the game me sword fighter <laughs> uh, right, did, did 2018 have any uh honorable mentions for you oh absolutely uh hollow knight that game it's easily in my top five games of all time now i could see that Th the tone is beautiful the storytelling is beautiful because it doesn't just tell it for you. you you pick it up through little you know bits and pieces that characters might say or even like looking at the background and the, the environment the controls are tight it is such a satisfying gaming experience from top to bottom. Yeah. Did you ever rescue uh, Zote, that one, like, hero guy? <laughs> yes, Zote. I, I'm not sure exactly what it took to do it, but one time he wound up being in, like, the main drag of, of the village that you start the game in, and he has, like, 50-some-odd yeah, uh -huh. principles to live by. Oh, I read, I read every single one. I read every single one, and some of them changed my life. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is no joke. Like, some of them are just thrown in there as funny bits of humor, but sure. many of them are, like, Bible-level proverbs, where he's, he's, like, spouting pieces of wisdom, w words of wisdom to live by. And I'm like, wow, that is, I I'm going to actually start attempting to infuse that philosophy in my life a little bit more. And did you, did you end up fighting Zote? Yes. And he is tough. Did you have any other Hollow Knight thoughts? Yeah. It's uh, actually one of my top video game soundtracks too. It's good. Especially like the City of Tears. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. I think that's where it really had me. I, I was I was into it, but once I got there, I was like, oh, I'm I'm committed. Yeah, and I think I actually remember we talked briefly about Hollow Knight. When I first got it, I asked if you played it, and you're like, yeah, I played a little bit, but my brother's mostly playing it. Yeah. I think you had told me. So it's really good to hear that you actually went back in and just dominated it. Yep, totally did. 100 hours. Did you, did you try the Path of Pain? I did everything. You did the Path of Pain, too? That thing is, I gave up. I tried it once. It's a secret room in i forgot what area i watched a youtube video of a uh, um no hit clear of the path of pain and it's ridiculous it was ridiculous it was super super the only thing i did not do is i could not beat the coliseum the final stage of the coliseum i can get really far in it. oh yeah i can get like towards the end but i 
I can't do it, but I've done everything else in the game. And that, that Path of Pain was so satisfying to beat. And I remember thinking as I was doing it, I'm becoming a platforming god. And, <laughs> and as, as that was, because I died like a bajillion times. So it's not really yeah, like I'm any kind of exceptional player. It's just that I, com I put the time in. I just committed and I kept playing it and kept doing it until I was able to unlock the next skill level. It just left me with that overwhelming sense of, achievement which i think is what what a really good game does no matter what the difficulty is but if you feel accomplished at the end then that that's what creates the memory is the in that case the pain is what made the memory yeah yeah but it's that it's so satisfying i just i love it did you have any 2018 games that fell short of your hopes you know i was thinking the same thing like that there were games that you know all the games i've purchased i liked but there actually was one that I was pretty hyped for that didn't kind of live up to that, which was uh, Octopath Traveler. Oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't play it, but I know it. I, I played the demo. I loved the look of it. It was beautiful, beautiful look. And I actually only played the demo because once it got to the full release, I actually didn't get it because the the idea of the eight separate characters all kind of going on their separate journey to reconnect and like all of that, they didn't really tie it together, I guess, in a way that was the point of the Octopath Traveler, the eight characters. I don't know. I guess the the, the demo was fun, but uh, it just didn't seem like it lived up to that, I guess. I might get around to playing it eventually. Yeah, that is a shame. It seemed like a really ambitious project. I liked the look of it, but I knew immediately I was out because it was one of those massive JRPGs. Y yeah. <laughs> like if, if you say, okay, massive JRPG times eight, I'm like, okay, I'm out times eight. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on to 2019 here. I'm going to do this one in reverse order. Okay. Th this was a huge year in gaming. It almost like impossibly huge. In fact, it was impossibly huge. When we went into 2019, we knew we were going to get a Luigi's Mansion 3. We were going to get Yoshi's Crafted World. We were going to get the first console mainline Pokemon game. We were going to get Fire Emblem Three Houses. We were going to get... Animal Crossing, oh, if I'm not forgetting stuff. We also, oh, Mario Maker 2. Mm -hmm. I think far and away, even though 2019 could not offer anything that could rise to the heights of Breath of the Wild or Smash Brothers, but on the whole, I think for the Switch, it was an unbelievable year. They, they had a lot of home runs. Maybe no grand slams, but a lot of home runs. As I said, it was impossibly huge. Animal Crossing had to defer and move into the next year. But I don't think that's a problem at all. Mm -mm. Because, as I said, it was busting at the seams with games. I still have a backlog of games that I haven't completed yet that I really want to get to. But the game that let me down, and I'm going to also qualify this as saying, I love this game. I think it was fantastic. I had a ton of fun with it. It just did not live up to my hopes for it. And that was Yoshi's Crafted World. Hmm. This game is super accessible. I play it with my kids. I loved Yoshi's Woolly World for Wii U, and we just beat the living daylights out of that game. We played it till the wheels fell off, and I felt like the two-player co-op was, was perfect. What they do in Yoshi's Crafted World is they make it so easy to jump on the other person's back that we're constantly accidentally doing it to each other. We're constantly interfering with each other's progress, and... When my kids are playing with each other, they're fighting over that constantly. Get off me. Get off my back. Stop doing that. But you really can't control <laughs> it because even when I'm playing as an experienced adult gamer with 30 plus years experience, I'm jumping on people's backs. So that let me down. And also, I would say that the music in that game is fine. But the music in Yoshi's Woolly World is unbelievable. It is one of the best soundtracks of any game that I've ever played across the board. And it's so varied in style but I wish I could just take that soundtrack and put it into Yoshi's Crafted World, which kind of makes a point to be juvenile deliberately as a, as a point of style, which is okay. I just, I'm not into it enough. So while I do love the game, I would recommend it. I played it a lot. Uh, I beat it with my son. We bonded over the game. I, he, they still enjoy playing it. There's a lot of really creative, inventive worlds. It did fall short of Nintendo's promise, which was you could flip the world at any time. That was kind of the core conceit of the game where you could play through the, the diorama side and then the flip side. They changed that by the time it released to you have to decide before you go in whether or not you're going to be on the diorama side or the flip side. So you can't really flip it at will, which would have made the game better. I'm not sure what contributed to them not going that route, but ultimately my hopes for the game based on what I had experienced with Yoshi's Woolly World and... 
also what Nintendo had promised, left it a little flat compared to my expectations. Hmm. As far as uh, a game that I thought was really amazing, but not quite my top game of the year, I have to go with Luigi's Mansion 3. I think it was so amazing. Definitely the best in the series. Uh, I loved every Luigi's Mansion game so far, but this one I feel like really nailed it. They gave you really good varied level design. It was really fun, but what sent it home for me was the unbelievable co-op. The co-op was so good where you could just jump in, jump out with Luigi from any time and have my kids come in and play with me was a blast. So that means that my top game for 2019 is none other than the game that I've logged the most hours in in 2019, and that is Ring Fit Adventure. <laughs> this is, uh, and it's not because of the story. It's not because of the the RPG elements. It's the culmination of the game's ability to make exercising such a unique and exciting experience. I found myself wanting to go back to the game every day. I found myself having to stop playing because my body ran out of energy. <laughs> I did an eight hour workout one day. Whoa. And it was because I just so badly wanted to challenge myself and see if I could get through the next thing. And every time you complete an objective, it unlocks branching paths that open up a new objective. And it was really addicting to, to want to do it. I found myself grateful for my level of fitness so that I could experience more of the game. <laughs> If my body couldn't hold up, I'd have to quit sooner. So it's a game that not only really excited me to the point of completion, but the post game is very robust and I'm really excited to continue on training with this game well into 2020. All right, what do you got for 2019, Brandon? Okay, so we're starting with disappointing. I would have to say uh, my biggest disappointment would probably be Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night. Mm. Did you get it for Switch? I was planning on it. I didn't pre-order it. And I'm like, oh, let me wait till it comes out because it was re being released on other consoles. And I have a PS4. So got released. And from everything I was seeing, it was basically just terrible on the Switch. Yeah. If you had two systems, there was no point in getting it on the Switch. And since I mainly play handheld, uh, that was a huge disappointment for me because I was really looking forward to playing it on the Switch on the go or just, you know, in handheld mode. And I was very disappointed by that. I was hoping that they would patch it enough so it was more playable and lived up to the PS4's playability of it, or it just... Surprisingly, they are still tinkering with it. They are still tinkering with the Switch version to make it a little bit better, but I still think it probably falls well short of PC, and I don't know how it compares to the other ones. But... Yeah, yeah, it, it does, and I just, I just never got to it. You know, that was kind of an out-of-sight, out-of-mind thing, but I could definitely chalk that up to some disappointment for me, too, because I was like you. I fully planned on buying that game. I love the style and i thought all right i gonna get some classic castlevania style action in here but yeah i just could not suffer the the laggy buggy yeah it was just too much and i love castlevania the the castlevania ds games are oh, some of my favorite games on the on the ds yeah and symphony of the night of course is fantastic uh so, as far as the games I liked, I didn't actually get many of the big releases. I haven't played Luigi's Mansion, didn't play Super Mario Maker 2. I would like to play Luigi's Mansion at some point. I played a lot of indie games this year, a lot of them. Some, you know, older releases like Cuphead, Castle Crashers was <laughs> ported to the Switch, which I love that game. But some of my favorites are probably um, this year Katana Zero, which was a fantastic 2D game. Had amazing combat, you could slow down time, which was a really cool effect there. I don't know if you played Katana Zero, but... I took a hard look at it. I really am interested in it. I almost pulled the trigger a couple times, and my backlog's the only thing that held me back. It's it's great. I played it all in, like, basically one sitting. Okay, so it's pretty short? It's short, but there's a lot of different things you can do. D depending on how you uh, interact with certain people at certain points in the game will change the story slightly oh which is cool yeah it, it adds some replayability to it there's some different weapons you can collect and i thought it was a fantastic game mm. i think the most fun i've had with the switch game in 2019 though was probably untitled goose game oh yeah i loved that game so much yeah it's so great we had a whole episode of this podcast dedicated to how much we love that game uh, i did 100 it did you yeah i did yeah it's it's amazing there's something 
so compelling about just being this menacing goose going around and being a uh, jerk <laughs> i don't know yeah just, and you, this is unrelated well i guess it's a little related i looked up there's just randomly on facebook this video of a real life goose fighting cows came up in my <laughs> in my stream and somebody had added a wizard hat to the goose and like a force shield and so every time these cows came up to the goose the goose would like push him away with this force shield, but I could tell it was real footage. So I immediately went to YouTube and looked up goose fighting cows. You could, you guys could all do it at home now. Go, go, go look up goose fighting cows. It's unbelievable where this goose is like headbutting these cows and the cows are backing off. It is the most wild thing. <laughs> and then I went down this rabbit hole of watching geese fight animals that they had no business fighting and winning. <laughs> and. Like, if you would have said to me, hey, have you ever seen a goose fight an elephant? I'd say, no, why would a goose fight an elephant? Have you ever seen a goose fight a gorilla? No. Well, that's because gorillas don't fight geese. They run. They run from geese. <laughs> but elephants, nobody messes with elephants. Nobody does, except geese. So this goose was going after this elephant, like trying to climb up his trunk. And the elephant's trying to like whack him and sometimes get him. The elephant was like back kicking him, straight up Taekwondo back kicking this goose. And the goose was still coming back for more. And I started to think, is this <laughs> not the toughest animal in the animal kingdom? I know people talk up honey badgers, but come on. Geese, they, they just do not care. And to be able to be that goose in Untitled Goose Game was a blast. So you know what, actually, I'm going to go back on something I said before. I'd rather see the goose in Smash Brothers <laughs> than Crash Bandicoot. Oh, yeah, kind of me too. <laughs> <laughs> but what I really want to see is a sequel to that game where it is yes. like that YouTube video where I saw. I want to see like goose at the zoo, like a goose escapes the zoo and he goes and menaces all the other animals. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, and you can let them out of their cages and oh. That would be fantastic. They could give it a, a title this time. It could be like, the, the goose is loose or something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's too obvious. I love that game, though. The, the graphics are great. They kind of remind me of uh, Katamari Damashi, which is another fantastic series. Is that a video game series? Yeah, Katamari Damashi. You're the, you're the prince who has to roll up items on Earth to recreate planets and stars. Oh, this is a new one for me. Really? Oh. I never played it. Is it on, is it on Switch? They did release the first one on Switch. It's called Katamari Reroll. Okay. Check it out. It's an older game, so the, some of the controls are a little janky, but it's still so much fun. Awesome. I'll check it out. It's really it's really wacky. But Goose Game kind of reminded me of that sense of humor and the look of it. It's just it's fun. Even when you're not going for objectives in the game, it's just fun to drag things around and throw them in the lake or whatever. Yeah, isn't it so crazy that the the way that the game is designed a lot a lot like Breath of the Wild in fact, where there's a really protracted cause and effect experience where you do certain things and it leads to a whole chain of events that might have nothing to do with the game or your objectives. And yeah. I, I felt like there were so many untapped things in that game where they could have had objectives based around certain objects, but they just didn't, which made me think that it was super ripe for DLC. Maybe that is something that's still a possibility. It was such a he massive success that I think there's going to be another one. Or at least a chunky DLC, yeah. So you guys heard it here first. The Goose is Loose 2020. <laughs> <laughs> and a Goose con confirmed for Smash. Yes, Goose confirmed for Smash. That seems like a good way, a good time to wrap this up. Before we go, though, Brandon, for all the good folks at home who want to follow you and your antics, what's the best way to keep up with you? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. That's where I'm the most active usually, uh, at Brando Meyer, B-R-A-N-D-O-M-I-R-E. And if you want to keep up with all of the things Nintendo Wire, you can check us out at NintendoWire.com or the Nintendo Wire YouTube channel where most of my content goes. Amiibo Jason recently put up a really cool episode where he converts a First Four Figures Luigi trophy into a supersized Amiibo. So give that one a watch. I also have a new episode of Spirit Trackers that went up relatively recently. If you want to give that one a watch, let me know what you think. I would really appreciate it. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at Custom Conquest. Brandon, I want to thank you again for jumping in last minute, saving the day like the legendary hero that you are. Thank you for having me. Hopefully this is not the last that we see of you or hear from you rather uh, on the podcast. I'm really glad you are able to jump in. Yeah, me too. And thank you guys all at home for listening to the show. Hope all of you enjoyed a great holiday season. 
And here's wishing all of you a very happy new year. See you again in 2020. Thanks for playing.